Hi, well, my name is Nicole Laracy. I teach English at UAB. I've been there, I've been here for 16 years, uh, and I teach primarily composition writing and American literature. But my degrees are dual degrees in English and theater. So it was, a, you know, maybe 10 years ago that I decided I wanted to put theater and drama back in my composition classrooms. Um, and I felt like this was um, just a genre bending kind of crazy thing to do. And I found out though that other people um, are doing it. Hey, Carrie from California, <laughs> get the distance prize. <laughs> Um, so my background then um, evolved from composition and theater um, influences in composition to really doing almost every class that I teach as a service learning class. So then it began to be community writing all the time. So whatever we did, we did as a sort of gift to the community, as a function for the community. So what I want to talk to you today about really adds up to how drama as um, a sort of community event can help with community problems like um, there's a theater in Kentucky called Apple Shop Theater, and they work a lot on environmental issues from like coal mining. Um, and so communities will come together and build theatrical productions around those problems, for instance. Uh, so we'll be looking at some examples and then a little ways into the evening. I think my cat is trying to tear down the door. So if you get a cat coming in, don't be scared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are about five mammals that could come through the door at any moment. So y'all just um, check it out every now and then and see who's trying to get in. So what I want to do is read a play from Lee Shackelford, who is um, a faculty at UAB in the theater department. And he has done a lot of work on 10 minute plays, but the play that he has uh, offered up for us to work with today is a one minute play. So here are the questions, right? How do you do theater in a way that's gonna be useful because theater is so expensive. It takes so much time to produce. It takes months and months to practice and rehearse. Well, up comes the 10 minute play festival and then the two minute play. And now behold the one minute play. So the first thing I wanna do before I get too uh, intellectual is read Lee's play. I'm gonna read the play to you. I'm gonna read a couple of roles. And so you uh, may now I have to do it dramatically because you can't read along with me. So it is a one minute play. It's formatted according to a specific drama format. And if you do that, then you know that one page is equal to one minute. So that's how you can tell if you're writing a one minute play or a two minute play. Here's the play by Lee. One of us is empty inside an extremely short science fiction drama by Lee Shackelford. At rise, a rather ordinary looking young man, Norm, stares into space as Andrea, his exquisitely attractive companion, struggles to draw information from him. Andrea says, I, I sense that I've displeased you in some way. If so, you must tell me how I should change to be more to your liking. And Norm says, it's, it's nothing you've done exactly. I don't know. It's some sort of a, just how things are. I don't know. And Andrea says, Norm, I cannot improve myself without guidance as to what errors I should correct. Norm, no, Andrea, listen, you're beautiful and sexy and smart and funny. You're everything I requested. They made you to be just, just perfect, but I don't know in the last month or so. Andrea, is it my cooking, my housekeeping? Is it the sex? I know you're very particular about your specifications. Norm, the sex is great, Andrea. It's just I'm feeling empty. I don't know what I thought I'd feel. Andrea, it seems to me, may I propose a theory? Norm shrugs. Andrea, it seems to me that since my mechanisms and programmings are built to meet your every conceivable need and my personal appearance was meticulously crafted to meet your desires, this emptiness you describe may represent some shortcoming within yourself, perhaps a misguided belief that life with a fantasy partner would naturally lead to a lasting contentment with no other effort on your part. Norm stares at her blankly. Norm. 
No, no, that's not it. Andrea, well, it's only a theory. They stare into space, in scene. So there you have it. You have a whole play on one page, right? So what are the parts of the play? We had a really good title. We had some set instructions, some scene instructions. Uh, we have two characters. So listen, um, theater is hurting for money these days, even worse than, than, than it was since the pandemic. So you never wanna write a play with more than five characters because it's really expensive to produce a play with more than five characters, right? So there's some practical advice. Download the PDF from the Dramatist Guild on your playwriting format. One page equals one minute don't have more than five characters. That's some of how to get your play put on a stage. And then you have a situation, you have a complication, and you have a resolution. Situation, complication, resolution. And that's whether or not the play is an hour and a half long, like a Hamlet, or one minute long, like this play right here. So let's go back then to my lecture. And I want you to just sort of sit and think about whether or not that one minute play worked for you um, and whether it really felt like a play to you. Um, I just kind of want you to let that marinate a little bit. And then I'm gonna go back over to talk to you about um, what drama has to do with community. So, you guys have been working, some of you who have been participating in the festival on fiction, on poetry. Some of that is flash fiction, some of it is long fiction. Sometimes the poetry is long and short, but really in both of those genres, there really isn't anything for the audience to do in some ways. Like the, the, the text is, is written and then somewhere privately, the reader is going to read and respond to that text. Maybe in a classroom, they'll talk about it. Or maybe if they have intellectual friends who like to read the same thing, they might talk about the effect of the text on themselves. But they won't experience that in community. And that's the unique thing that a piece of drama has to offer. It's the community element. In fact, as Augusto Goal says, uh, he's a Brazilian playwright, whom I'll talk about in just a few more minutes, that everybody in the theater, the actor, the director, the stage designers, the audience members, they're all what he calls spect actors. So no one is playing a passive role in the transaction of giving this piece of writing drama to the audience members who are right there in front of the actors. So it's all a very active moment. And we do that in terms of um, you know, poetry slams and anytime you read creative work when there is an audience. But for this situation, we'll talk specifically about drama as a genre. So the next genre I wanna talk about is memoir writing. So a lot of times when we think about writing memoir, we think about writing um, maybe a whole life, it can, as a whole autobiography or we think about writing um, a little, you know, little section of um, a significant life, Ben Franklin, Harriet Tubman. Um, but it's become more and more popular as we all know for people's lives, everyday Joe, this everyday citizen to, um, to share to snippets of their life. What's it like to mother 47 kids? What's it like um, to uh, live in the wilderness? Uh, this sort of like spending time on other people's couches and other people's living rooms. There's this sort of hyper realism that uh, led to memoir um, craze. We want to know what's happening in people's lives. We want the I to be really pre present. I feel, I see, I am, I do. And that's a movement in literature that has also affected drama. And the next thing we're going to think about is healing. To what extent does a piece of literature offer anyone healing? 
So this is not a, I mean, I feel like maybe five years ago, it was a radical question and a radical concept, but not, not anymore, you know? Do you feel like this is, uh, would you rather have, for instance, a physician at your, at, at your sick bed or maybe some Emily Dickinson? Okay, well, you can have both, right? You might want both. Uh, <laughs> so it's not an either or. So if you look at community writing for healing, um, you take this memoir I and it becomes a we. So just as there are no passive participants in a theatrical production right down to the audience, the I really turns into a we. The empathic structure becomes this group um, and it's not nearly so much a singular sort of passage where you're watching a writer tell their story. Um, and so it gives itself really easily and well to telling the stories of the problems of the community which then brings me back to Augusta Boal and the theater of the oppressed. Has anybody ever heard of him? So that's a book title. At some point when I get you guys writing here in just a few minutes, I'm going to, um, to write the uh, references in the chat, but the first book title is by Augusta Boal. He's a Brazilian playwright and he wrote theater of the oppressed. And that really has become a movement in theater um, where there are all of these companies across the world who use the methodology to, to enact rebellions, to work against the state, to um, rise up with the peasants. Uh, and that's really in keeping, now I'm talking a little to more people who might have more English degrees with Paulo Freire's work and empowering pedagogy. Anybody know about Freire? So Freire is much more in your sort of regular college classroom where we want to hear from the students who are first year college students. We want to hear from people who aren't accustomed to being intellectuals and we're learning in the last 20 years, you know, to listen to their voice. Well, Freire is also from Brazil, from that same political moment that uh, Boal is from, encouraging us to do these theatrical interventions. So now we're calling it an intervention. So one story that I like to tell is from um, a group called the Medea Project in California where they uh, did stories of HIV and AIDS patients in uh, California. And then doctors studied the effects of these stories on the patients. So much like what I'm suggesting, the patients became uh, mentors. They became tellers of their own story. They voiced their own problems. And in doing so, they uh, were seen in this study by the people who researched the effects on the storytelling to take their medicine on time more often, to um, show up for doctor's appointments more often, even to do things like leave abusive partners more frequently. So the effect in this study on the Medea project was that in having um, AIDS and HIV patients tell their own stories in a theatrical setting, then they were healthier. There was a physically healing outcome to the theatrical intervention. And so that's kind of what I'm interested in. And so uh, I have a lot of stories that I could tell you along those lines. Um, I'm highly influenced by a book called Trauma and Testimony, The Limits of Autobiography by Lee Gilmore. Um, in which she talks about how important it is to witness. And, and yet sometimes witnessing to these traumas can get really painful. So if you go back to where you learned about Elato Equiano, that first slave narrative, anybody ever study Elato Equiano's first slave, this first slave narrative, in which he's telling the story of himself as enslaved and uh, readers are confused because they don't understand how I got to be smart enough to write so well. Um, and he's doing a lot of classical conceits in his writing and they think, you know, obviously you can't have written this. So there's a question of truth 
And then there is in the reception a resistance. They don't want to know all the details about what was true about slavery and the horrific humanitarian abuses. They wanted to stop listening. And so Toni Morrison says that, you know, in her fiction, she rips a veil off of the imparting's too difficult to impart. They're going to make even the white abolitionist women in the North faint if you tell the truth too closely. So any of these political memoirs that endeavor to change some sort of a political landscape, like I, uh, Rigoberta Menchu, she's a Guatemalan peasant. She's telling the stories of rapes and, and abuses in her culture so that hopefully maybe America and other first world countries will come and help, right? It's definitely her audience. Well, all of, all of a sudden, instead of uh, trying to help audience, People will be like, oh, well, is this true? Can I, can I get some, some factual information? So um, there is a man named Vincent Coretta who is a historian who spent a lot of time trying to really disprove a lot of Equiano's claims. Where was he really born? Was he born in South Carolina? Well, maybe there's some proof that he wasn't actually born in South Carolina. Where was he buried? Was he actually a slave? And all of this is beside the point, right? Because what you're trying to do in these theatrical interventions and these community plays for healing is tell the truth of a community. So it did turn out that Rigoberta Menchu, for instance, said something had happened to her brother that really happened to her cousin. And then we get back to memoir. When you're trying to tell the truth of what happens in a life in order to tell other people what it's like to be you. For instance, in the stories of the Me Too movement, sometimes that truth is with a capital T. So if you're trying to tell a story in which there are eight women, eight sisters, for instance, but you know only uh, plays with five characters and it get, get published, well, you can turn three of those sisters into one person. And that's still memoir truth. So I wanted to get at that a little bit for you, like where in um, nonfiction do we fudge the facts in order to get to that capital T? So I wanted you to think about that just a little bit. Any questions so far? Okay, so we're gonna go back to our one minute play. Um, and we're going to think about again what are the, the the parts of that play i'm going to set you up and i'm going to give you about 10 minutes to write your own play and so um i want to see you writing i want you to ask me questions in the chat um and but to inspire you, first I'm going to give you your prompt and the, and the kind of rules that, that, that I want you to follow. And then I'm going to show you a video of a, how you can take a really complicated story and drill it down to a one or two minute play. So what are, what are the parameters? Well, your story starts with your title. I know a lot of people don't care about titles, but I definitely think and if you have a page like Lee Shackelford had for his one minute play, uh, one of us is empty inside. That's a really important sentence. Every word counts. So that's number one. Every word counts. Number two, you have to have some sort of a problem. And I've sort of charted this evening to be about community problems. Well, what are some community problems that you're worried about? Is it the environment? Is it plastic in whales? Is it um, how UAB ate Birmingham and displaced housing? Um, and then how do you reconcile that with the progress that UAB brings to the city, for instance? Um, is it the HIV and AIDS crisis from the 1917 clinic? Uh, what? So first, pick a problem in a community. So second, how do you tell that story? Do you want, I'm going to say two or three characters tonight. That'll be enough, right? And then what's the complication? Here's the thing. I have taught this kind of playwriting um, 
and, and created these kind of storytelling moments with patients at the HIV and AIDS clinic, with uh, students in downtown high schools, high schools, and at two maximum security prisons. And one time I was teaching a course with Dennis McLaren, who is a fabulous uh, theater professor here. And he said, look, it has got to be as dramatic as possible. Bring in as many dramatic complications as you can. Bring it, bring it, bring it. And I said, no, Dennis, people like realism these days. They want it to feel like it could actually happen. All these complications are not real. And then I looked at a room full of maximum security prisoners and they were like, you think lots of drama isn't real? So another thing that I learned to do is add some sort of magic to it. So I'm playing around with this notion of a sort of magical memoir, like magical realism. I told you guys to tell the truth, but I also want people to hear it. I want them to care. So I'm writing a play or I've written a play called One um, Bodies of Water. And uh, in that play, uh, similar to the play by Alison Brechtel called Fun Home, the character that plays me is me from four different decades. And then there's one that's me from seven or 800 years ago, right? Sort of this iconic me. And so I've learned that when we're doing all of this drama and we're doing all this difficult stuff and believe you me, the plays that the prisoners, the students at the prison, let me stop calling them prisoners. I'm, I apologize for that. The students would produce, they will break your heart in two. And if you remember your Shakespeare, there has to be some sort of comedic relief or else we can't keep paying attention, right? We're gonna faint from hearing the truth. So for me, instead of adding comedy, I started add, adding magic. Um, and you see in Lee Shackelford's piece, he added science fiction, right? So there was this little bit of zing from reality. This little bit, and you can do that with satire. Like I'm reminded of Jonathan Swift's modest proposal about eating all the two-year-old babies in Ireland to solve the famine problem, right? He didn't say, he didn't eat newborns. They didn't have enough meat on their bones. You had to wait until they were two, right? So what is, what is it? There's a premise. And in this case, I want you to have the premise be a community problem. I want you to pick two or three characters. And then at some point, in the complication, I want you to add something that's not quite real. Is it science fiction? Is it magic? Is it too much satire? You know, just really pushing it, like getting people to eat babies. Um, and so in that complication, we're gonna add something that zings out of our, our, real, our realism sphere. And we're not gonna be afraid to be too dramatic and have too much drama happen on the page. Just give it, give it, give it, give it, give it. And then a resolution. So. Um, yeah, and you've got 10 minutes to do that. Start with the title, a premise that is a community problem, two or three characters, complication, and within that complication, some sort of magic, and then a resolution. Make sense? Any questions? All right. I'm going to go in now and I'm going to try to share my screen again, but this time I'm going to show you a short video that I have to pull up. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Obviously, technology, we have to be able to live without technology. But let me see if I can give you this video because I think it will really inspire you and amuse you. I think it's just having trouble pulling up. So why don't you guys go ahead and start writing? This will be a good time and then I'll inspire you maybe halfway through. Um, so I'm gonna start the clock for five minutes in which you start writing. And you know, maybe you have to write your title at the end because you don't know what your clever twist is gonna be until you've already written. Maybe you have to start with characters. Okay.
I would, um, if I were writing this, I would do the UAB housing dilemma in Birmingham, just to give you an inspiration for a community problem. Or whales eating plastic. Take about 30 more seconds, and then I'll see if you've got any titles to share. Okay, 
Anybody have a title or a problem they want to share? If we could hear from maybe three people. Haley? <clears throat> My title is, no, we won't take your money. And no, we won't take your money? No, uh, and it uh, revolves around the absurdities of uh, getting a loan. Ah, nice. <laughs> One more person? Maybe two. Just the premise that you're working on or the community problem. Um, I um, have a title, Medusa's Glasses. Uh, the premise is um, women, uh, rape survivors not okay. being believed. Nice. Um, Good title for that. I'm immediately taking it. Thank you. Thank you. One more. One more. Okay, well, maybe we need some an inspiration. Kitty, uh, Carrie, drop one down in the chat, please, lady, about, please. <laughs> about homelessness in LA. Nice, good job. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys keep writing. Um, I'm gonna do it for another five minutes. I'm a little ahead of schedule because uh, you guys are probably pretty happy that I didn't get to read all of my fancy quotes to you. Um, so five more minutes, keep going. I wanna hear more about it. Title, two or three characters, premise that's a community problem, complication that has some magic and some realism. One more minute. Great. Does anybody have a title or a premise they want to share that they've come up with in the next five minute cycle? Art that they would be willing to share? I don't have a title yet, but I'm writing about uh, like industrial pollution in rivers. Good. Yeah, I mean, we have that super fun site right downtown, for sure. So I want to share this with you just to lighten the mood a little bit, get your creative juices flowing. And then I'm hoping that um, you guys will share some of your drafts with us um, uh, once we do a round or two, one more round of writing. So this is from anybody um, ever heard of the Reduce Shakespeare Company? So here's a great example of how to take uh, arguably the longest play ever and the most dramatic. How many people lay dead on the stage at the end of Hamlet? At least eight, right? Um, and so what they've done here is they've just finished uh, giving a sort of shortened version of the play and now they're gonna make it even shorter. Are you ready?
everybody knows the story of Hamlet, right? We've got Ophelia, the ghost. three more minutes, so we're going to go through Hamlet one more time very quickly for you. I just need to make one quick announcement because we do have a few children in tonight. Um, as we go through this, we're going to be moving very fast this time. Now, there's a lot of sharp swords that we use. There's falls that we take. There's props that we send flying back and forth. We make it look easy, but it's actually very difficult and very dangerous. So as you watch us do this, please keep in mind that the three of us are trained professionals, okay? Do, do not, not try, try this, this at home. home. All right, <laughs> Yeah, go over to a friend's house. As much as I'm just, I'm just, hey, hey. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. My lord, I think I saw your father yesterday night. Would the night would come. Mark me. Oh, no, 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 something is rotten. My, 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 my lord, this is strange. There are more things in heaven and earth. So kiss oh. off. To be or not to be, that is a good get into a name. Strippingly on the tongue. You are the play. You I'll take the, the ghost word for a thousand pound. Now, mother, what's the matter? Oh, that murder me! Help! 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 Now, a rat! Dead for a ducat! Dead! Now, Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. Where's my father? Dead! Ah! Sweet Ophelia! <laughs> Alas, poor Europe! Oh, but so you drown it. Queen. Slay her in the earth! Slates to the swing! Pull off the earth of wire! It is I, omelette to cheese, Danish! The devil take thy sins of oils and for me! Lie out! The silence. And wait for it. Ladies and ladies and gentlemen, we shall do it faster. <laughs> <laughs> We shall do it backwards! <laughs> I got caught up in the moment. How's that gonna work? Can we start off again? All right. Anyway. This could be you. Be sure to listen for the satanic messages. <laughs> Silence is rest of thee for I. Frank Sinatra is God. Sweet of my own. Foil the yes give. Dane the Hamlet I is this. Earthy of old. Sweet that's too sweet. Earthy in her life. Queen that comes here. Yorick for alas. Oh, feel you sweet. Fuck of my heart. Strange as this, Lord My. <laughs> Denmark of stately and rotten is something. Yes, and I thought they also I think I lord my flesh solid to to this that oh, oh you think <laughs> <laughs> So that's ridiculous. How ridiculous is that? <laughs> okay. So where are you? Does anybody else want to share first lines, characters? Tell me what you're doing. If they can turn that hour and a half worth of very complex drama into two minutes, you can pull something out in two minutes. Um, it might take you longer than two minutes to write a two-minute play. Yeah, that's the thing about flash fiction. 
right? It takes a minute. The poet's going, yes, it takes a minute. <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer what they're working on? I'll go. Um, okay. it's, I guess the premise is similar to, uh, to homelessness. It's two men in a rainstorm sharing a doorway downtown, one in a t-shirt, one in a suit, and the inequities between them. That's about as far as got so far. What are they talking about? Um, okay, let's see. Uh, the man's in, a, in the suit. Well, it's suit and t-shirt. So the man in the suit um, ducks into the doorway. Shit, I'm going to be late. Where are you headed, buddy? Oh, nothing. Just uh, going to blow everything, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, telling the t-shirt, lights up a cigarette, offers it to him. Oh, hell no. Um, I didn't. Uh, can you put that on? I'm going to smell like a cigar store. Hey, I didn't invite you in. That's as far as I got. <laughs> You know, there's a guy downtown, I think he stays mainly around the pancake house and he doesn't really wear pants. So he's the pantsless guy. Haley, you know him? Yeah. So there's something about clothes and costuming. You can, you can communicate that yeah. in theater as well. Right? Sure. And I think he wears bandanas around his leg. He wears bags around his leg and a giant hat always. Oh, wow. Yeah, the pantsless guy. What else are you working on? So where are you having difficulty? I'm still trying to think of what magical thing needs to happen yeah. along the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a curveball, ball, right? That's just me. That's Dr. Laracy saying, let's think about magical memoir because I made that up the other day and I like it. But that's instead of Shakespeare's comedic relief, right? I mean, I'm trying to tell the story like Lori of severe trauma, serious trauma, sometimes including, you know, my children who are still around to hear the story, you know? And so it just gives me a little bit of remove from those gritty, gritty, dirty details. And you see that in Fun Home, Alison Brechtel's uh, musical that started as a graphic novel, um, where she's talking about um, her father's death. And in, this, in the play, she sort of, and in her memoir in general, she tracks when she came out to her father's death. I mean, there's some problematic, faulty causation with her father's death and her coming out. And um, she puts this in musical format and there's just some improbable magic in it to just give us a little bit of palatability for these difficult stories. Um, so the next thing I think I will, I wanna keep us on time, um, share comes from Let me see if I can get it. <laughs> Good luck to me, right? Comes from something that I wrote and published, but it's really, it's, so the name of my essay is Staging Stories That Heal. Oh, here it is. Staging Stories That Heal, Boal and Freire in Engaged Composition. And what I really wanted to show you this is a little quote. So one of the plays that I worked on called One Clear Light really um, highlights the work that Dr. Michael Sag has done um, in creating one of the premier AIDS and HIV clinics in the country alongside the very first of the AIDS epidemic. Can you imagine placing that in Birmingham, Alabama? Um, the other one was in California. Um, so it tells, the play tells that story, but I used, um, mentors in the clinic who wanted to tell their stories. I had my students interview so many um, patients and mentors, and then we created characters. Um, and that play starts with a talking dog at Bandelier. Uh, uh, but here's the quote from um, my participant. His name is Alan Wolhart, and he says, the play, it's different. It's like a gift. It was given to me and I never thought that I would be ever be in a play. I'm a gay man and I don't have children. My brother couldn't have children. 
our name at the end of our lives will be gone, absolutely gone, but my name will be in the play and it makes me feel good. And my student, John says, it's like a legacy that you're leaving, being able to put part of this production that's really a big focus on the way you're living your life right now. And he says, I can't tell you how overwhelmed I am. So that's just to say how meaningful, like maybe if we got the pantsless man to talk about being homeless in Birmingham, right? It would be just like that. Or any of the women who are telling their stories, you know, from a Me Too perspective, um, what it means to people to, to see characters depicting them on stage and to hear their story told. Um, and so that's just always my, my reason d'etre for community writing for healing. And that's where I guess I'll leave it. And I'll put this link um, in the chat. Does anybody have questions, comments? These are great kind of icebreakers if you're going to some sort of community event where you want to figure out what the community needs and, and you're trying to help do whatever service you're, at, you're working on, cleaning up the rivers, um, getting these sort of moments, these storytelling set, moments where people can actually share these stories with one another um, can really get those things going. So. I think that's where I want to leave it. I'm very interested in seeing how your um, one pagers, one minute plays go. You know what, if it turns into a five minute play, I would understand. Uh, but go to the Dramatist Guild and download that PDF on the template of uh, playwriting format. So it's not rocket science. You just follow that format and then you'll know how long it is. Any other questions or comments? Kaylee, you have any announcements from the festival? I do. So um, just to remind you guys that on Saturday, we have our uh, sonnet workshop with Jason Walker, who is getting his MFA down in Florida um, right now. But he is from Birmingham, the Birmingham area, and uh, one of UAB's own. And then um, I should remind you guys about the Spark Writing Festival uh, contest. Right, so uh, we just announced that two days back. Um, so let me pull up the link for you real quick and I will drop it here in the chat. Uh, dun, 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 dun. There you go, there's a link to our contest that we are running. And with that, uh, you'll have the chance to be featured on the Spark website and also published by Beham Now. So um, exciting things ahead for us. And on um, Sunday, we have uh, Irene Latham and Kareem, uh, Kareem Shimibasha, and they will be doing our keynote speak, talking about um, their book together and the Caldecott honor that they won. So really excited to have them around. That is at two o'clock on Sundays. So that is our only event that doesn't take place at 6 p.m. So do make sure that uh, you're around for that. And uh, I'll see you guys later. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Nicole, for, yeah. for your work. You're welcome. So my, my UAB email is nicolelaracy at uab.edu if you want any of these links or if you want to find out where I'm teaching these courses. Um, and you can find that how to spell that on the UAB English website. All right. Great. Okay, thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Y'all have a nice evening. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.